and welcome to Community Kitchen. It's um, looking like a little bit of rain out there, which I think everyone's looking forward to. And in fact, when you look at New York and places like that are suffering badly, we feel uh, a little bit sad that we're wishing for rain, but we need it. This morning we've got a couple of great uh, guests. We're going to be talking to a Bill Winner. And he is the beekeeper service manager for Capilano Honey. And I'm sure everyone has heard of Capilano, family business. Um, got a couple of fantastic giveaways also this morning. Capilano have generously um, offered to give our listeners who'd like to phone in some fantastic little honey packs. They've got some new items on there. So listen for that a little bit later. And also it's Bush Tucker Month down at Redcliffe and we're always talking to uh, Joe and Michael Connolly they have some fantastic things happening down there at Clontarf and each year we follow them up and they've got a couple of good weekends happening in November, a few workshops going so we'll be talking to Joe a little bit later because there's um, some wonderful things to learn about our native spices and native meats and I'm sure you've seen them when you're out in restaurants now, there's a few different things on the menu um, and also we're going to be talking about the article in the Courier Mail today. We're talking about the uh, the big overweight factor that's happening again. It seems to be there all the time. So we're going to touch on those details. But um, at the moment what we'll do is we will go to a song, probably not as rocky as the last one, and we'll come back with our uh, first guest, Bill Winner. And welcome back to Community Kitchen. We have our first guest online, Bill Winner, who's from Capilano Honey, and he's the beekeeper service manager. Good morning, Bill. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. That's quite a title, isn't it? It is. It is. <laughs> and you, you've been with the company for some time now. Yeah, just over 20 years. So tell us, what does a beekeeper manager, service manager do? Uh, basically interfaces between the company and the honey producers so that uh, I deal with let the, the company know what the beekeepers are doing and the beekeepers know what the company's doing. So Bill, with your business, I mean Capilano honey, I'm sure everyone has a, a jar of Capilano honey, whether it's in their pantry or somewhere in the in their house. It, it, it's been going for, well, 60 years next year, which is just incredible. But has it the change do you actually grow have your own bees you look after or do people actually do that and supply honey to Capilano? we rely on on beekeepers who have their own beehives mm -hmm. and uh, so we, we range our honey from basically south australia tasmania victoria new south wales and queensland uh, with all deliveries coming into our brisbane plant there's been uh, quite a few, bit of concern for the um, beekeepers in the last few years with different bugs that are coming in and, and uh, we have weather changes. Has that had a big effect on your business? It has. The drought was uh, particularly severe on beekeepers. That, uh, beekeepers used to say they were migratory. These days they're more nomadic in that they are forced to, to move into areas to produce honey that they wouldn't traditionally have, have worked because of changing climatic conditions. Uh, there are, we, we haven't really been troubled so much uh, as yet by the, the difficulties that other countries have faced with the Varroa mite, but we do have problems in the north where we have an invasion of a, or an incursion of an Asian honeybee, Apis serrana, and uh, that is going to cause us problems over time. But for the moment, in the southeast and through the main part of the eastern states, uh, we just deal with our normal problems, mostly weather. Mm, it's it's amazing, and when you think of these pe different bees coming in, you know, a lot of people over time have you know smuggled th stuff into the country, and you just, I, I just wonder sometimes whether there's that total lack of thought of the incredible impact they can have on an industry. And that is true, and, and the impact is great. The, uh, to bring in a, a bee that might be carrying a varroa mite, which is a, a little blind blood-sucking mite that uh, can decimate beehives. It, it, uh, it has a major impact particularly on feral hives, so the sort of hives that you find around uh, a city that pollinate a lot of gardens, it'll take them out. Um, we had a, a little beetle that came in to Australia in about 2000 called the small hive beetle, and it's had a tremendous impact on Queensland beekeeping, virtually made beekeeping on the coast of Queensland nearly impossible for some years. I think uh, it's amazing. The one thing that I, I wondered, and I was reading about the history of the gentleman who started Capilano, and uh, I mean, it's, it's actually quite romantic, isn't it, when you think about uh, why they named the, honey, um, the company Capilano? Yes, yeah. A lot, of, a lot of people think that the name is, is Italian, but it actually has its uh, roots 
in Vancouver, Canada, where uh, Tim Smith met uh, his wife-to-be at the uh, Capilano Golf Club in, in Vancouver. And uh, they obviously, his, Tim's brother Bert uh, always referred to Jill as Tim's Capilano Honey, and that logically the brand name became Capilano Honey. <laughs> That's incredible, isn't yeah. it? And I, I imagine, like, over the years, it must have been such a different game for them when they started. Oh, yes, yeah. Tim and Bert both came from a very poor background in a small farm down behind Talabodura and uh, then moved in closer to uh, into the Water Surface Paradise. Um, and they, or Southport, and uh, Tim started his beekeeping, had a, about 60 hives of bees prior to the war, and uh, we actually had 120, that's right, and he sold 60 of them when he went off to Canada to train pilots for the RAAF. And when he returned, he'd had a uh, an, an older beekeeper down there by the name of John Rosser who had looked after his bees extracted the honey and his, his sold the honey and his parents banked the money for him which gave him a, a nice little bank roll to start off with and, and they basically packed honey underneath their house at Southport wow. and then 1953 they came to their current Richland site in Brisbane and uh, from there on in it was a case of uh, well I tried, they were commercial beekeepers both Tim and Bert very progressive, but found it very difficult because in those days, beekeepers virtually took a tray of honey around and they hawked their honey to different packers, and the packers would either not want the honey or offer them a low price, and they decided to have a go at packing themselves. And uh, by the 1960s, they'd formed the Capilano Apiaries, and away it went. So it, it became one of the world's leading honey packing plants. But they can't be young men, but are they still involved in the business? Uh, sadly, both of them are deceased. Oh, they have. Yeah, Bert in uh, 2006, and uh, Tim only passed away on the 19th of September this year uh, at the age of 95. So he wow. had a grand life. Incredible. Yeah. So <laughs> there is something for that uh, staying active. <laughs> staying active and eating honey. <laughs> and eating honey, which gets me to my next question. I mean, people think honey is just honey, but there's so many different types of honey. I mean, we're using it now for... For years ago it was used for medical and, and I think there's a bit of a push for getting back to that now. Yes, I, I can still remember my grandparents saying that if you get a burn, put honey on the burn it has a wonderful healing effect on the burn and in recent years uh, the, the use of leptospermum species of honey which have uh, special activities in them that are not found in other honeys to the same extent uh, have been used for the treating of leg ulcers and uh, other uh, very serious conditions they even can have a, an impact on stomach ulcers uh, if you get the right honey for it which is basically the, the leptospermum species uh, which is marketed as manuka or jelly bush in Australia oh, I was, uh, okay so that's just the name of the manuka is, is a honey that you can eat anyway oh yes but you can also use it for the medical. A little bit expensive to put on bread. A little bit expensive. To <laughs> <laughs> now, thinking of the different products, um, I notice and I always say to people I'm talking to that I go on the internet and I have a little bit of a, a look around. You've got these new honey shots. What's this all about? Well, they're, they're an a, a absolute delight in that they provide an energy boost at a set rate of about 7 grams of honey. Uh, if you're interested in diet, that's a perfect size for to have on toast and uh, it will not do too much to weight gain. Uh, but from the point of view of energy, there are a lot of people who are involved in sport who find them terrific. They can have them in their, in their pocket or on their pouch on their bikes and have a little, just snap it and suck out the honey and they've got the instant energy boost that comes from the taking of honey. Uh, school children love them. Uh, they've, they've proven very popular. They promote honey well, but they also have a... A, a useful purpose in that they are in such a good pack and are readily available to uh, to provide that energy boost. I think honey is such a good thing. I mean, just reading in the Courier Mail today, they were talking about once again our big waistlines and everything that's happening to people. And they were saying that the um, the average person, for men, for example, can only have nine teaspoons of sugar, and women six to seven. Um, you know, and people forget about the fact that you can use honey to replace so many good sugar, um, you know, so many recipes that have sugar in them. Yeah, and with honey, because it, 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 as its sweetness level is higher than the normal sucrose, white sugar, so you really only need to use just a little, just a little bit more than half the volume of honey to achieve the same result. 
And if you happen to be involved with Weight Watchers, one of the honey shots is about one pro point. So it comes in, you can measure the amount of uh, carbohydrate you're taking in. Probably better than drinking those um, very high sugared energy drinks that there's that they're out and about. Your website's got some fantastic recipes. I guess this is another change that um, you know has happened in the last uh, almost 60 years that yes. this company's been going. I mean, it's incredible to see the progress. It, it is a public company now. It is. It's listed on the Australian Stock Exchange. That's incredible, isn't it? Yes. To think that these uh, the men are the families still involved with running the business? Not at this stage. No, there, there's a couple of them would still have shareholdings, but um, but not actually in the day-to-day running of Capilano. I think it's quite incredible. It's an admirable thing when you think about family and business is always one of those things to avoid, and yet these guys seem to um, quite happily have run their company for for many years. Ah, oh, yes, and and Tim Smith in his life was just generally or universally known as Mr. Capilano. Uh, it, yeah, it, it, they were larger than life people. That's incredible, isn't it? And one thing I guess I was quite interested in was the the changes that the men would have seen. I mean, they would have had so much of their physical time put in there. They would have been doing the old style of extraction of honey and things like that. Nowadays, it's it's a more uh, machine operated extraction. Absolutely, Tim, and in particular, well, and Bert uh, to a lesser extent, their involvement in the company was very much the the management of the company. But physically, Tim was involved in making and actually constructing hot rooms, working on tanks, physically involved in making and installing honey packing equipment, whereas uh, now it, it's grown to be a much larger company. Um, they were at one time basically running little fillers that would fill 50 to 60 jars a minute, whereas now we have two lines that are capable of getting up around 150 to 200 jars per minute each. Wow. Uh, it's, it's a... a massive growth in technology and, and they were at the forefront of it they fully encouraged beekeepers to, to advance their extraction techniques to be conscious of the better working conditions for themselves so that they protected their backs, their bodies beekeepers, beekeeping is a very hard physical labour and uh, so they, they weren't only interested in developing the company and making money, they were interested in improving a lot of their suppliers as well that's incredible, isn't it? You must enjoy your job, Bill. You've been there for 20 years. Yeah, no, I was the, I've been in the industry 42 years. I oh. previously wrote a magazine on beekeeping before coming to Capilano. So, uh, yeah, it's a great industry and, and there are some fine people in it. I'm interested when we had the Kabocha show here last year, it was, um, you know, you get around and you have a look at all the different pavilions and, and uh, it was fantastic to see that one of our young guys in the area he's just started up with his own beehives and he, he said it's just an absolute passion to him now and you get caught up in it is that something that you can relate to yes yeah I, when i moved first from uh, maitland in new south wales to brisbane I, I sold my beehives but i'm back into it again now just having a a, a recreational interest in beekeeping it, it gets in your blood you can't get away from it <laughs> I think that uh, we we keep saying here on the show that it's one of those things that we must respect because um, you know we the bees do so much good in the world um, apart from giving us honey we just need them so much and yet we, as you were saying before there's so many pests and bugs that are coming in that uh, it we'd hate to think it was an industry that was threatened. Yeah, and honey is just a small part of it. The the real value of beekeeping in Australia, indeed the world, is through their pollination of uh, the various food crops food security in the world is a major issue in Australia it's a major issue an example is almonds for instance if you didn't have the beekeepers taking their hives by the thousand to the almond belt down the uh, around Mildura there'd be no almonds in Australia mm. so they, they are vital it's a, a multi-billion dollar uh, advantage to the economy to have beekeepers and beekeeping so it's a, an industry well and truly worth preserving. I think that, um, in fact, when you say the almond industry, it's one of those um, trees that doesn't have to be treated. That's incredible, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Uh, now, I noticed that also in your... I mean, I've taken off some of the recipes here that I'm going to share with our listeners a little bit later. Um, you've got an organic honey. Yes. How does that work? Organic... Uh, the honey that is organic, it, it has to be produced under very specific, specific conditions. There's a... The Australian Certified Organic, for instance, have standards, and I think uh, Aquis have standards as well. And the beekeepers, um, it is basically chemical-free beekeeping. Yes. Um, they have to be 
particularly careful to have no agricultural pursuits within a five kilometre radius of where the apiary is set up. That's about 74, 75 square kilometres per apiary site, mm -hmm. which could have 120 hives on it. Uh, and, and so they're not exposed to any of the agricultural chemicals that worry so many people these days. It's a, a very pure form of beekeeping. It was something that I really questioned because I, I, you know, remember reading this article of a gentleman in Western Australia who had a fantastic organic farm, and then they had the genetically modified foods coming, um, crop coming in beside, and it he eventually had to close down because of the bad effect. And and uh, so it was just one of those questions I had to ask because I thought, how on earth can you contain a, a bee? Um, that doesn't actually wander into areas it's not supposed to. Yeah, well, you just you just place them carefully. But in in essence, uh, even it, it's a cause of some uh, conjecture amongst beekeepers because of the beekeeper bees being so susceptible to chemicals. Beekeepers generally keep their hives well away from a lot of the agricultural areas, and so honey in general is is a very pure food. Uh, but there are there are obviously some things that you can avoid by being on an organic site. It's difficult, it's very hard on the beekeeper to find the country that he needs. It's very, very difficult to sustain. We, uh, we find that we've only got six suppliers who are capable of living up to the organic standard. Wow. And yet a lot of the honey we receive from our general uh, commercial beekeepers would be of an equivalent standard. That's incredible, isn't it? I must say that we are now the proud owner of a couple of hives. We invited a young guy to come up and put some hives in our property because we've got some beautiful timbers. And uh, it makes you feel good when you know that you've got the, uh, you're contributing to the increase of the bees. Yes. Have you been stung yet? No. I don't go near it. <laughs> Right. I'm going to leave that to him. Okay. <laughs> but I think it's nice to, uh, when you do have some, you know, fantastic timbers that you can actually leave the bees up there and, and you know that they're, you know, doing their work and, and getting them organised because, um, and I'm sure you're aware of it in, in Queensland, we're not allowed to have the beehives in the state forests anymore. So it's actually really restricting a lot of the, um, the beekeepers as to where they can find land. Yeah, we're very hopeful that that, um, that was a, a problem that was facing the industry, but it, it may well have been put on hold by the present government, which is a relief to beekeepers, but it doesn't mean to say the problem's gone away forever. Oh, well, I, we keep mentioning it because I think it's a very important thing that we uh, keep pushing against The industry that. very much appreciates that. <laughs> Excellent. Very nice to talk to you, Bill. We're going to be asking a couple of questions for our listeners later because uh, you're company has generously offered some giveaways nice talking to you and 60th birthday next year yes yep. it's a long time isn't it it's, a, it's an anniversary worth noting yes i think so well thank you very much for taking the time to be with us this morning thank you bye now bye. And uh, we've been talking to Bill Winner from Capilana Honey. So if you would like to um, to win one of these fantastic packs of uh, Capilana Honey, you just have to tell us what birthday will they be celebrating next year. And our number here is 54951015. And Capilana will happily send you out some of their amazing, they've got some beautiful... Um, honey and ginger blends, their honey shots, their creamed honeys. So, as I said, if you'd like to ring in, uh, 54951015, you only have to state what birthday they will, they will be celebrating next year and uh, we'll organise for Capilando to send you out a, um, a beautiful honey pack. We're going to go to our sponsors and we'll be back very shortly. And you're back to our community kitchen and we have our next guest online joe from and we're going to be talking about bush tucker month good morning joe good morning how are you i'm fine thank you i can't believe it's a year since we talked i know <laughs> it, goes around a bit it does you've actually increased your um uh, bush tucker month this time you've got two weekends happening well, yes, we've moved our um, business into new premises, so we're showcasing the whole business and um, it gives us opportunity to be able to spread the bush tucker over a whole month to give people a lot more opportunity to experience it and to, um, to make it available to them. So, Jo, where have you moved to? Um, we've moved from the out of our uh, home and into a, a lovely shop and office gallery premises in... Uh, Quantas, Unit 7349 McDonnell Road. Oh, that's excellent. So people have more access to everything? 
more access, better parking, um, a lot bigger room to browse and a lot more comfortable. <laughs> you're still doing, I can imagine, you're still doing your Australian Aboriginal art and craft? Yes, 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 we certainly are. Um, during the month of November and December we're going to be open seven days to give people the opportunity to um, um, come along and see our shop during their, their spare time. I think it's amazing. The one thing I notice about the different bush tucker that's around the place, we're just seeing it more often, aren't we? People are seeing it, not realising what it is. Um, and the purposes of you know these workshops and um, events is to bring awareness so people actually know what they are. And most of the time it's in their backyard. We've got lily pilly trees, lemon myrtle trees, um, around here and I'm sure most people don't even realise they're native. I remember going to a workshop with uh, Dale Chapman and she made this fantastic cheesecake and it was with a wattle, um, I think it was a wattle? That wattle she, seed, yeah. Wattle seed. And I was watching something on Landline on the weekend and they were showing this beautiful little tiny seed and they were saying just how much flavour comes from that. And as you say, they're, they're there in our backyard. Well, that's right. Well, the wattle seed's got a cross between a coffee, hazelnut, chocolate flavour and it's just so um, wonderful. And it has, you know, multi-purposes. You know, you can use it as a... Um, uh, cooking on your steaks and adds a nice little um, flavour to steaks and especially kangaroo. And you're selling all those things? Yes, we've got a complete range of products. Um, the one thing that we did find that um, a lot of people wanted to try bush tucker but it was too available in too many different places so we've put it all in under one roof and um, so uh, you're not sort of lose interest by the time you collected all your um, or your products. I think that's the whole thing about cooking, isn't it? You've got to keep that momentum going, otherwise it's just one of those things you just don't... You lose interest very quickly if it's too hard. Well, that's right, and it's not something that you see on the um, every shelves every day, so it is a, a gourmet range, I suppose, mm. and um, they're not easily sourced, but we do have um, Witchley Grub Bush Food Nursery coming down at the end of the month um, with their plants and so you can learn to grow and even try and grow your own native plants in your own backyard. I was telling someone about their nursery the other day and they were amazed that they were just at Conondale and they have such an incredible um, range of trees that you can grow in your garden. Well they're very simple you know native plants they've been there for you know hundreds of thousands of years so it's, they're very sturdy and hardy and easily to maintain even I can grow with the odd <laughs> The odd plant, so that's saying something. <laughs> I take it you're not much of a gardener, Joe. I, as I said, my family find it rather amusing that I'm in the, the plant and the, the food industry, um, but I'm testament to the fact that um, if I can do it, anyone else can. Oh, that's wonderful. Now, there's, I noticed that um, there's a special offer you've got here with the workshops with Dale Chapman. Uh, yes, every person who books a workshop will receive a complimentary ticket in our raffle to win a $100 gift voucher with Tucker's Restaurant at West End, a beautiful, fantastic restaurant, and $50 Kalila cash to spend. So they will be able to experience um, a lot more and enjoy Bush Tucker a lot more. Well, I'm hoping that we might be able to either catch up with Dale or one of the other exhibitors there before that time. But Dale's very interesting. She's cooked uh, in some amazing places. That, yes, she's just gone everywhere and um, we're very pleased to be able to um, snavel her and to be able to get up and close and personal with the workshop. So Dale's a very personal, personable person and um, it's a good opportunity to, you know, to ask questions and she'll explain things to you in you know, layman terms. And you'll, she'll be going through the bush tuck of food and, and, and cooking that? In the, it's what, a, a, one, two, a two hour cooking? Yeah, it's a two hour uh, information about what to do, what not to do, what to look for. We've got three workshops, uh, one about native herbs and spices and fruits, um, easy cooking tips with bush tucker and Christmas cooking ideas now, Christmas looming up on us. 
I know. It's only four weeks away. <laughs> oh, no, eight weeks away or something. Oh, four weeks no, 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 about eight, I think seven or eight weeks. I, I find it amazing. That's what I was saying to you. I can't believe that it's been 12 months since we talked. Um, and, you know, it, it just goes so quickly. Now, Joe, do you think that for people who are wanting to do any of these workshops, it's a good idea to book? Yes, there's, uh, now that the, um, the word is out, people are starting to put their names down. So there are minimum um, places, so they need to contact us and get their name down on the list ASAP. Um, there, it's a value, $30 a workshop, but that includes um, a $5 gift voucher from Dreamtime Kalula Art. And to be able to go down, you know, once you've done your workshop, you can go down, source your products, um, and then off you go and c create a masterpiece. Well, especially if you're um, lucky enough to be able to taste the lemon myrtle wattle seed cheesecakes or something. I mean, it, they're just oh, the cheesecakes are just absolutely divine. Oh, nice. No. I have I've had the pleasure of trying that one time at the uh, Caboolture Library when she had a workshop there, and it just tasted beautiful. And you just think it's something that's such a small little seed that she um, finds in the garden. Um, I'm sure we could all learn from that. Well, the same with lemon myrtle. You know, there's just so many. Um, uses for it um, plus you know they have the medicinal qualities to a lot of these plants too so not only does it taste good it's good for you I noticed that um, my lemon myrtle actually if the, my calves get into that little area they love it they keep brushing on it so it must have some effect on them or it I don't know what it, what it does but well, they lemon myrtle is very good to keep the um, sandflies and skeeter so it's probably um, what they're doing is um, coating themselves um, and keeping the, the the little bodies away. But they must because I notice that they, whenever they can sneak in there, that's the only tree that they all seem to attack, which is quite interesting. I didn't know that, so the next time I go fishing, I should take some of that. Well, you know, then I'm early, and you have to crush it, and the um, the oil infuses, so it's um, it, it's instant. So it's not as though you have to sort of you know really extract. You know, you just have to um, break the leaf or the stem, and you've got that instant um, aroma. It's beautiful. It is a nice thing. Well, that's great. I'm sure that there'll be some people uh, interested in knowing that the uh, workshops are on and it's Bush Tucker Month and uh, new premises. So, of course, they can always just go on your website if they need to find out what's going on there, which is um, if you'd like to share that. Yes, it's www.kalilaart.com.au. Thank you, Joe, and nice to uh, have you back on the show again. Thank you. Well, don't leave it 12 months next time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. And, uh, and that's all about Bush Tucker Month. And it's exciting, isn't it, when you can see a business, as we were talking with Capilano before, and, uh, and Joe and Michael have, um, have been doing their Dreamtime Kalula art for some time, new premises, new ideas. Um, always great to see those sort of things happening in our um, area. I can't say shy, I'm not allowed to say that apparently. Um, but in this uh, Moreton Bay region, we've just got so many good things that we need to look out for and... Uh, and that's why I often say share it with us because it's nice. Some people are interested in gardening, some people are interested in eating. Um, if we can get out there and, and report these different businesses, it's so nice to be able to share that. Um, I think we're going to go to our sponsors and we'll be back and we're going to be sharing a couple of uh, recipes with you this morning. And welcome back to Community Kitchen. I really had to go over this article that we had in the Courier Mail today, Our State, a Wasteland of Gluttony. One in five Queensland toddlers and one in four children aged 5 to 17 are classified as overweight or obese in the latest snapshot of Australians' health. Interesting, isn't it, that they talk about the, BM, the BMI, the Body Mass Index, and in their calculations there, and if you've got a Courier Mail, it's worthwhile having a look at it, because they're talking about Alex Glenn, who was a Brisbane Bronco, so he's, if you do the Body Mass, he's classed as obese. Uh, Jonathan Brown, Brisbane Lions, he's classed as overweight. Kim Mickle, who's the uh, Olympian javel, javelin thrower, she's over, borderline on overweight. So if you think of these guys as, I mean, you look at them and you think they're super fit. So it's interesting 
to uh, to look at that. But one of the problems, I think, is the fact that um, nationally, since 2007 to 2008, the number of overweight and obese children of all ages has increased from 143,500 to 736. I mean, that is incredible. And it was interesting when I went down to the Jamie Oliver Ministry of Food Truck talking to the different women there and some of the reasons that they were there was to actually learn how to cook and learn how to provide better food for their children and it, the whole topic of conversation um, and I sound like I'm being a little bit of a traitor here but listening to ABC on the way down this morning they were saying that this one whole generation of children is just going to have so many problems because of the obesity um, David Gillespie who we've had as a a guest on our show a couple of times. He's the author of Sweet Poison and Big Fat Lies. He was sp uh, speaking this morning, and as I mentioned earlier, he said that the uh, a man sh can have up to nine teaspoons of sugar a day, a woman six to seven. If you think about that, that is one can of Coke. That's it, nothing else. You cannot have any more if you want to stay within what is the guideline of recommended sugar in your diet per day. Um, I don't know. I think that if we look at so much introduced sugar and so much introduced fat in our diet, a lot of people would be having a hard time keeping underneath that level because basically everyone has up to 25 teaspoons of sugar a day. Um, it's incredible. If I put that in a bowl in front of you and said to eat that, um, it's such a lot because there's sugar hidden in so many things. Of course, I'm going to give you honeybee cupcakes later, which has got sugar in it, but we're not talking about sitting and eating all of these in one go. And, of course, we do have sugar in our diet, but there's so many things that are just flooded, like cereal for children. I think parents are going to have a hard time keeping their children down to two teaspoons of sugar a day when some of the produced cereal is just coated in it, some of the um, the poppers they give and some things that are recommended by the Heart Foundation evidently are highly um, filled with sugar. So it's a tough choice, isn't it, when you have to go shopping and there are all these different things you have to look at. But I guess, as uh, one lady was saying in the article in the Korea Mail, she did all of her grandmother's shopping and her grandmother never requested anything from the the inner, inner layers of the supermarket aisles and we've discussed this before that most of the time more fresh produce is on the perimeter if you can stay within those shopping areas um, you're pretty well okay because none of your food is going to be processed or refined so you just have to keep reading, keep looking out. It's your choice, but it's just one of those things that we have to look at. And, and it's good to bring things to you, but this body mass index is quite amazing. Uh, have a look at that because looking at those, uh, those sports people there, they don't look like they're overweight or obese to me, but apparently that's what happens. So we'll all be calculating tonight. We had a great time talking to the Capilano people, and of course, as I said earlier, they got a fantastic prize for people who'd like to ring up. A wonderful, one of their fantastic gift packs of six different varieties of honey. Just ring on 54951015. All you've got to do is say which birthday, and we talked about it before. It's their birthday next year for Capilano. If you phone in, um, we'll organise for Capilano to send uh, one of those out to you. I think that the um, the nice thing about these websites, and I know people get a bit over technology, and I am one of those people, but I do love being able to Google. I do love to be able to search different people. And when I looked at the Capilanos yesterday, they had the most amazing little honeybee cupcakes. I know it's hard sometimes providing things for children to eat. I thought I'd share this. It's just such an easy little recipe. 125 grams of butter, a third of a cup of capilano honey, a third of a cup of caster sugar, teaspoon of vanilla extract, two eggs, one and a quarter cups of self-raising flour and a third of a cup of milk. And of course what you're doing is your oven is 180 degrees. You're probably going to be baking about 12 little cupcakes. Um, mix your butter, honey, caster sugar and vanilla together until pale. Add the eggs, um, add your flour and milk and stir with a wooden spoon until combined and you're baking for 20 minutes. Leave them in for a little while after they've finished baking. It makes it easier to get out. They've given a great frosting here that's 60 
grams of butter, a quarter of a cup of capilano honey, 250 grams of icing sugar mixture, two to three teaspoons of lemon juice, and uh, if you want to put a little bit of um, lemon rind in there, that's great, and yellow food colouring, have a look on their website and see the cutest little honeybee cupcakes that they have made there. I think it's interesting to think that sometimes some simple things can be so nice. They've done a beautiful range of roast vegetables, and just by pouring a little bit of olive oil and honey over the top, it just makes all the difference. Sweet potato with honey and carrots roasted, how delicious. And a spiced honey citrus iced tea. And on these days when it's very hot and we've had some real stinkers, um, all they're doing here is putting some tea bags, um, one small orange thinly sliced and cinnamon in a large saucepan. Um, Add some water, so you're probably looking at about six cups of boiling water and cook for one to two minutes. Stir in some honey, so you're probably looking at about a third of a cup. Um, Strain the tea into a jug and add two tablespoons of lemon juice. Um, divide between glasses and top with heaps of ice, some lemon and mint. Um, make it a head um, because that way you've got beautiful spiced honey citrus iced tea. Simple, nice, delicious. Sometimes we forget just how good that is. And if you think about a can of Coke having nine teaspoons of sugar, we've only got a third of a cup of capilano and they've used organic honey here and I must say I was quite cynical about the um, organic honey but after talking to Bill and he was saying that it is such a um, a very special uh, type of apparist who is able to produce that and have high standards so there you go guys you can actually get organic honey I kept thinking that uh, we couldn't tell the bees where they weren't supposed to be scooting about. But um, they seem to have quite good uh, levels of their standards, so that's fantastic. 60 years, their birthday. I think that is an admirable thing when you think about if you've been in business. Sometimes it can be very tough in a family business operating for that length of time. And I like the fact that Bill was talking about the gentlemen who were so physically involved with their business right up until the very end um, kept them going 93 or something when they passed away I think that's quite incredible so we'd like to thank them for joining us this morning Bill a winner from Capilano Honey and he's the um, beekeeper service manager so I'm sure that's a very pleasurable business he's been in, in honey for 40 years and still in that business and of course we're talking to Joe from Kalula Art down at Clontarf and they've got new premises and their bush tucker month is coming up November 17th, 18th and the 24th and 25th and we'll be talking to Joe in a couple of weeks and um, I think we're going to be talking to a couple of the exhibitors there um, about different cooking and food. Hopefully we'll be able to um, get Dale Chapman, even though she's a very busy person. Thanks for joining me this morning, and um, don't forget, if you would like to win one of those fantastic Capilano honey gifts, you only have to phone 54951015, and let us know what birthday Capilano will be celebrating next year. Thanks for joining, and thanks for, for panelling, Leslie.